Kim, Unified Large Scale Forecasting System for Load Gas, Solar, and Wind, and Julia, right. Jan, please. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jan. I work for a company called uh, Tangent Works. And today I'm going to talk about a product called Tim and especially the development journey we did with the product and uh, how Julia was uh, involved. So Tim stands for Tangent Information Modeler. It's an automatic model building engine for uh, time series apply to the energy vertical and hence the title Unified Large Scale Forecasting System for Load Gas and Solar and Wind uh, written in uh, Julia. So let me start by giving you a bit of the introduction on how actually a product can emerge. It's typically a combination of a uh, of couple of fields of expertise. So you need to have a bit of the domain expertise to understand why you are solving certain problem. Then you need to have a, also knowledge on how to solve it. So whether what it should be, should it be your differential equation solver or image recognition solver or what kind of problem you need to solve using your mathematical knowledge. And then finally, and this is very much related to Julia, uh, you need to have computer science skills, you know, so that your implementation is uh, obviously easy to maintain, uh, quick to, to deploy, quick to develop, and uh, which just uh, works fast. And on the intersection of those three fields of competence, uh, this is the intersection where a lot of value can come out, and this is where typically a product emerges. So I will walk you through the journey which we did uh, since a couple of years ago. So we started like four years ago. I will explain you why we created the product, what the product actually is, and then how we did it. So in the why, I will give you a brief introduction on the energy industry and problems there. In the what, I will explain you what the product actually does, how it looks like. I will also provide a very quick uh, demonstration. And then finally, how, this is very much related to Julia, I will explain you our development stack, let's say four years ago, our development stack two years ago, and on the development stack now, and how Julia and certain features of Julia helped us to move forward. So, in the why section, uh, I will give you an introduction to time series problems in energy industry. In the what section, I will talk about what we actually build, what the product actually is, and uh, that is automatic model building engine for uh, time series. And in the how section, I will talk about the development in Julia and how it all started and uh, where we are uh, right now. So let me start with the why. Uh, energy industry, so it's electricity, it's gas, it's oil, it's water, but let me focus on electricity uh, for a while. Electricity grids especially, uh, they need to be in balance. So uh, simply speaking, you need to have certain balance between the amount of energy being fed in and amount of the energy being, you know, uh, consumed. If this is not the case, then it's a, simply a physical constraint over the cables of which grid is being built that uh, they will burn out, they will, they will damage, and then you will end up with a blackout. So that's why this balancing is very important. Balancing was, let's say, not too difficult uh, maybe 20 years ago because uh, you got like a couple of major sources of energy like nuclear power plants or uh, hydropower plants, and then you got a rather stable consumption side. This is not the case anymore. Uh, now we have renewables. Uh, also, your household, which is typically a consumption unit, can easily change into production unit if you install uh, photovoltaic panels on the roof. So the balancing is these days a lot more volatile and uh, it's a lot more difficult. That's why you need to forecast. You need to forecast your consumption side and also your production side across all your assets. So, roughly speaking, forecasting problems in the energy industry can be divided as follows. Uh, there is a demand side, electricity load, so you want to forecast on all levels of aggregations. You want to forecast maybe a single building or single household uh, consumption. You want to forecast also maybe consumption of entire city and, of course, consumption of entire countries. Then there is a gas consumption. There are also district heating problems and district cooling problems which needs to be forecasted. There is a generation side, so it's the other part of the equation. Uh, there is obviously wind production forecasting, solar production forecasting, small-scale hydro forecasting, and a couple of other problems. And then the balancing itself also has certain challenges like system imbalance forecasting, 
prices forecasting, technical losses forecasting, and some others. So to give you also an idea of how it looks like and how diverse those time series can be, I provide a couple of visuals. So this is a consumption over three years of a larger European city of uh, this electricity. Then here we have, again, a larger European city, but this is gas. You can see a bit of the difference that, for example, these bottoms there, they are like the summer period, so when you are not consuming gas that much. Whereas these peaks there, these are the, they call them heating periods, so this is the periods when in the winter you are using your gas for, uh, for heating up uh, your households. So that's why this has this characteristic. Then these are, these are prices. For example, these are three years of the electricity prices from United States. So you see again that uh, the time series is different. It has some spikes and it simply looks different than the ones uh, before. Then here we will go a little bit uh, on the single asset level. This is a consumption of a single cooling house, again, quite different. And this is a consumption of a single greenhouse, which you also uh, want to forecast. So all in all, in energy industry, uh, you need to forecast different problems. Uh, they are all time series, and uh, especially because uh, typically an energy company consists an asset of quite a different uh, generation sources and also consumption customers. You need to forecast them all. So it's quite easy the case that a single customer needs to forecast a couple of hundreds of different time series. The situation gets even more interesting because you might want to have like a uh, a special model for your intraday forecasting and a different model for a day ahead forecasting and maybe D plus two. And this is still the single connection or a single, uh, single asset. So a number of models simply, you know, explodes and uh, you easily need to maintain like a couple of hundreds or a couple of thousands of models even for a single energy company. So the need for volume is certainly there. So now we are at our what question. So those four years ago when we were founding the company, we were asking ourselves, okay, that problem of, uh, of the modeling in energy industry is an obvious one. It's gonna you know, only go a bit larger because like, uh, the volatility on the grid is getting higher and higher. And uh, that's why we decided to try to build something which would automate a uh, model building process of the energy time series uh, with a very high accuracy, with zero degrees of freedom, fully automatically. So this was our what. So we wanted to create automatic model building engine for time series, a generic one, and then apply it, you know, for the energy industrial vertical. So how we did it? This is actually a typical data science process, and uh, I'm providing this here so that you better understand what actually team does, where, where it picks the data and where it kind of throws them to the user. So this is a typical data science process. You start by collecting your data, then you store them and you transform them uh, so that they are ready for your machine learning or mathematical modeling task. Uh, part one, two, and three is typically covered uh, traditionally by uh, databases, by time series managers, players like Oracle, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and uh, other IoT platforms uh, are certainly serving steps one, two, and three. Then once the data are ready, you go to four and five. So this is a model building, and then obviously you are using your model for your forecasting. <coughs> And uh, this is what we automate. Uh, and then finally, once you have your model, then you typically present it using the presentation uh, layer. Number four and five is typically served by players like, uh, you have platforms like SAS, SPSS, R, all kinds of machine learning libraries. You have MATLAB, also Julia falls in this category. It's a language where you can actually build uh, your models. It offers uh, very nice tools for building up different kind of models. So we don't do one, two, and three. What Tim does is number four and five, uh, it automates uh, those uh, two steps. What it do, what it does is, uh, number four co consists typically of two steps. If you are having a new data set, typically you need to do uh, feature engineering because maybe you have, you know, three inputs and one output and you wanna try to find the relationship between them uh, and explain by a certain model. And let's say if you just use the inputs as they are uh, and you put, neural net in between or super vector machine in between or, or regression or Mars model in between, you get you know, a certain level of accuracy. But it's quite often the case that uh, if you create some features out of your variables, then you know, your accuracy goes up in a significant way. So feature engineering is a tedious task. It's quite interesting task, but it's a tedious one. 
And if you need to deal with a lot of volume of models, then you simply can't afford to do this. You need to automate this. Model selection is another uh, topic uh, which uh, is an intrinsic part of the model building uh, process. So once you have your features and you are kind of satisfied with them, maybe you want to test your neural net or your super vector machine or your Mars model or regression or you know whatever techniques uh, you have at your disposal. So in general, I think it's safe to say that features are a lot more important than the modeling technique you use, although it's still the case that you know you should choose appropriate modeling technique and modeling technique itself has its own degrees of freedom. So for example, if you would take a neural net, you need to decide how many layers, what kind of activation function should be there and how you're gonna train it, et cetera, et cetera. So this process, although it's a lot of fun to do for, you know, for data scientists, if you come to the volume and you need to forecast and generate a lot of models, then this needs to be automated and this is where, where we stand. So what team is, it's a modeling strategy. So it's not a model, it's a modeling strategy which is generating the model. So for each data set, you generate a unique uh, model. It has zero degrees of freedom in a business user mode. There is no feature engineering involved uh, for, for the user and uh, it offers high speed computing uh, on a standard hardware. Uh, I will now show you a quick demo so we have a good understanding uh, what it actually does and how it looks like. And uh, then we go to the how part. So we started a bit late, so we are running late, so I'm gonna actually show you just a very quick demonstration. So actually Tim sits in Azure, it's a, it's a, it has API, it's a model building engine, a kernel, and this is a simple front end which talks to the, to the engine. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna try one of the demo data sets, let me pick this one. This is a simple one, it's actually one from a certain competition, it's a forecasting of electricity prices in United States, the output variable is uh, price and there were two input variables. For, we don't have much time so I will not go too much into details uh, and I will just go straight to the next screen. So this is how it looks like. We've seen this before on the slide, a uh, couple of slides back. And now we pick two years for model building and then we save last year for out of sample forecasting and we build the model. So all we need to do, we send this data to the engine and we press build button. So now the data will be sent to Azure. It's already there. The engine is crunching the data and creating the model and model will be sent back. So this is very quick. And yeah, the model is already uh, available and it's being uh, sent back. Now we have the in sample part. We will do the out of sample here. So what we will do now, we will upload the model back to Azure with the new data and the model will send the predictions uh, with using those data uh, back. So. This is done. Interesting thing is that we can actually look at the model and at the features which were, you know, found important. So this is the tree map of the features which uh, were detected as uh, influential. And it's also important to mention that uh, it's not only the features and the kind of uh, how much variance they explain, but it's also their number. So what Tim does is that uh, it, it makes sure that, you know, it does not overfit. So this is the last feature which we use here, but we use certain amount of features and not more. Because if we would add more features, then we would get kind of uh, an overfitting uh, problem. I can maybe just quickly jump to another data set. So for example, this one. This has more input variables. So like we are trying to relate weather to the electricity load consumption. So again, we have different data. We build the model here and we just check that the model will actually look quite different to the model which we just saw uh, before. So again, the same process. The data are being sent to the API and API will send the model uh, very soon back. So here we go, it's almost done. So again, we have a model here. We can do, of course, out of sample forecasting, model is being sent to the API and we got the forecast back. So it's there and now we see that, you know, we have different features, different amount of the variance being explained by those features and etc. So, of course, we were asking ourselves how this automation, you know, is, is good, whether it's, it can match the human performance or not. That's why we also participated in some competitions where we, you know, uh, we, we put team at work and we were competing, you know, with other data science team. 
So we recently participated in those two competitions. It's a general energy forecasting competition 2017, which lasts for a couple of months. So it's a robust test of, you know, whether your strategy is good enough. And uh, we were really pleased that we actually won the competition. So we were first in the qualifying match, we took four months. And then we were second in the final match, which was a different task. And we were overall winner of the competition. Then there was also a competition with Andritz. It's an Austrian uh, big company, which is uh, doing a lot of different industrial things. Uh, also hydro turbines. And uh, there we won also the competition. So these are very encouraging results. Now how, and this is the, the, the Julia part. So our development started, you know, maybe four or five years ago. We knew our why, we knew our what. And uh, we started to develop first with a, you know, couple of languages in mind. So we wanted to, to find out which combination of languages would really work for us as a product development company. So we were exploring those different languages and, uh, you know, after checking a couple of options, we end up with this combination. So four or five years ago, uh, our development stack was uh, Octave, MATLAB, with then the C++ in production. This obviously caused certain, certain uh, challenges because uh, we got mathematical team and we got development team and because, you know, they were working with different platforms, it was a very natural thing that the kind of two islands emerged. And uh, there was, uh, you know, we had to put an effort so that those two islands communicate to each other in a kind of a straightforward and a smooth way. And this was, uh, I have to say, a significant effort, you know, to, to make this work. And then also that slowed down the development cycles, uh, I would say, big time. So then, also from HR perspective, it was quite possible to find a C++ developer who somehow liked working with uh, platforms like MATLAB, R, and Python, but it was nearly impossible to find a mathematician who equally likes, you know, writing code in C++. That was, you know, quite difficult. So there was also this HR perspective, which, if you are building up the company, is very, very important. Then three years ago, I heard first time about Julia from, uh, from a friend of mine, and I thought like, okay, it's a new language, you know, very young, it comes and goes. <laughs> so uh, I just had a brief look, and then I kind of forgot it for, I think it was 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 when I first time heard about the Julia. And uh, then again, it was a while, and then there was another friend saying to me that there is a Julia, and maybe you guys should have a look at that. So roughly three years ago, I had a serious look at uh, Julia. I spent a couple of weeks, you know, testing stuff, you know, trying to rewrite certain parts of the code which we have in Tim to Julia and then see how it performs. And actually, I was quite pleased that, you know, certain subroutines which were in C++ tuned to, you know, uh, I would say too extreme. In Julia, we got like very quickly a comparable speed. So that was like a very good motivation and very good start to, to explore this further. So after a while, I think it was 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 time, two, three years uh, back, uh, we switched in the prototyping to Julia. So we, you know, pushed away R and, and Octave. And uh, in production, we still kept C++. This is already a step forward because uh, the Julia syntax is not too different in a certain way from, from C. So also, I could get the interest of the C people, you know, to look into the Julia and those two islands got a bit closer to each other. And it might sound a bit silly, but it was actually a significant kind of step forward for the company. So our effectivity went really like, like up, maybe I would say by 50, if not 70%. So that was very, very important. And then recently, especially with the Julia 0 0.6, we completely switched Julia, Julia. So we are now prototyping in Julia, and also we are doing our production code in Julia. So actually, what you saw in the demonstration was the API was talking to the Julia compiled uh, kernel. So that's one part of the story. Another part of the story and, and the part where Julia really helped us was that uh, we developed this automatic model building engine for time series using some innovative mix of uh, mathematical ideas. Uh, and uh, in no language, so neither Python, neither Julia, mm, nor R, there were packages which, you know, could help us to, to move forward. So we actually had to develop from scratch. And it was also a very interesting experience with Julia because if you're developing from scratch, then developing an innovative solution really kind of tests the, the very foundations of the language and tests the, the design patterns which are in that language and tests whether the language is really, you know, useful for you. And 
we could quite quickly see that uh, Julia is, uh, you know, I would say an ideal uh, match for us because we went through all those different uh, design or, or features of, of, of Julia, like SIMD, loop fusion, map techniques, map reduce techniques, composite types which Julia offers, uh, clever iterables which Julia also offers, tasks, AOT compilations, and all of these features of Julia really helped us to, to move uh, the product forward. So actually, now I, I have a couple of snippets of the code directly from the engine, which I would like to show you, to, to, to show you, you know, how easy it is to express yourself in Julia, uh, although you have like maybe a complex task to accomplish. And I've also compared it with a kind of pseudo C code. It's gonna be also Julia, but kind of handwritten Julia. And you know, we can kind of check the, the visual pollution, also amount of the lines, and uh, you know, uh, the beauty of the code. So, one thing which we do in the engine is that we compute the Z scores of the data which comes in. And it's a very simple operation, right? So you want every single column of your matrix to have a mean of zero and the variance of one. So there is kind of no, 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 not too difficult thing to accomplish. So in Julia, if you use uh, loop fusion, you, you get your matrix X, you compute your, uh, your row vector of, uh, of a mu, uh, mean values and, and sigma values, and you simply do the second line. So Z equals X minus mu, slash sigma, and with the loop fusion operator, you, you know, you get a very, very uh, highly efficient uh, operation because the operation gets fused, broadcast, broadcasting will do its job, and you get the metric Z in uh, no time, so very effective. If you would like to do write this, you know, using a handwritten loop, this is still kind of, you know, a nice code. If this would be in C++, it would be a bit, a bit uh, you could like a fat uh, code there. And uh, you see like two lines which also mathematicians can read, you know, easily and reason about the code, and then the lines here. So this is a great help when you are developing a high-tech product. Because we are running kind of out of time, I will skip this one. There is another one. Uh, so this is a typical data set which is being sent to the API. So imagine you want to forecast load, and you have your temperature and your wind speed. Uh, you have the measurements, let's say, over a couple of years. In this example, you have entire year 2016, then there are some data missing and you have year 2017 starting from March. So imagine that you want to do something with the timestamps. So the following Julia code can help you a lot. So uh, you will put the start of the first continuous data block, the data are sampled hourly, in your variable A and you will create a daytime object. Then you would use another variable B to store you know, the end of the first continuous time block. In similar way, you will populate your variable C and D uh, with the start and end of this data block. Then you will set a sample step, which is one hour, and then you create those two uh, ranges. Those two ranges will be daytime ranges. So uh, then those two data ranges, R1 and R2, you can put them in a vector. And then if you want to do something, let's say, with the epoch value of each timestamp, you can, you can do this, so you can call map with a dot, so it's gonna be, you know, uh, fused, it's gonna be applied to R1 and R2. And then, let's say, you will apply first days of value uh, function, which will get the epoch time steps in milliseconds out of the every single <coughs> time step, which is actually, you know, stored very effectively just by storing the range objects, not the entire, you know, number of the, of the all time steps. And then maybe you want to compute like a sine function or whatever other function you would want to. And this simple line, just do the job. And I didn't even try to write this in a handwritten you know, way because it would be like maybe on a couple of pages of the code. So this is extremely efficient. Okay, <clears throat> the same example, if you would like to send that to API, let's say to, to Tim API, either from Julia or also from Python or from other code, it's this simple. So you just save your data CSV file in the CSV form, which is extremely you know, straightforward. And then you write a configuration file. This is a minimal configuration file for Tim in the way that you just want to say where you want to train and maybe you want to do out of sample check and that's it. You actually, out of sample part is, um, is not mandatory. You can just you know, uh, forget it and just send the data to Tim and Tim will analyze the situation and actually you know, when data are not good enough, it will tell you that you should not maybe use those data for forecasting because they are not of the good quality. So it tries to build model only, but it makes sense and uh, it tries to be a very high quality model. 
So you don't need any kind of background knowledge uh, from mathematics and still, you know, if you would use this engine, you would actually win the GEFCON competition even if you have no mathematical background because it's this simple to send your data to the API and uh, get a very high quality model. How many time we have? Couple of seconds. Okay. <laughs> so, couple of last slides. Uh, Obviously, AOT compilation was extremely important, and I'm going to talk about AOT tomorrow on a, in a separate talk. But uh, I wanted to share this slide with you because I've seen a lot of micro benchmarks, which are obviously useful, like some functions and other functions, between Julia and some other languages like R, Python, Cyton, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what we have in Tim, it's a complex machine learning pipeline, so it's not a single, you know, uh, piece of code which you need to optimize. But it's really it's a complex machine learning pipeline, so. You, you are using your map functions, your map reduce problems, your blast calls, your, uh, you know, composite times, manipulations whatsoever. And I think <coughs> this, is, this says it all because, like, we started with C++. So we were with C++ in production for a couple of years. And we now went to Julia, and the speed is extremely comparable. It's maybe, you know, with 0 0.7 or 0 0.6, a little bit more range here, we maybe get to the, to the speed of the C. But it's really comparable, and this is not a micro benchmark. So I think it's safe to say that the Julia is mature enough to really uh, match the speed of C, even for a larger software development projects. So this is also the message I wanted to, to share. Uh, the very, or almost very last slide, is the architecture of the entire solution. So people who are, you know, more architects, they might be interested in this. So actually, here are the clients who are connected to the API. There is a web service. Uh, which is written in the Spring framework, so this is uh, Java. We are thinking about maybe moving to Go or moving to, to even Julia because there are frameworks emerging for that. Then we have a queue manager, which is uh, RabbitMQ at the moment, and then this talks to the, to the workers which are, wor which are written in Julia. So this is the, the Julia part, and these team engine workers, they are AOT compiled. They have the C bindings, and you know they, call, they, they talk to the RabbitMQ. Uh, they will also be soon wrapped via AKS, Azure Container Services, so that it scales via Kubernetes up and down, you know, on demand. So this will be also very useful for trading applications because imagine you have a lot of models to build, you just scale it up and scale it down using your cloud technology. We have a couple of seconds, we're almost there. <laughs> so my final message is don't be afraid of using Julia in production even for a complex software problems because it really turned out to be a, a great win using Julia for, for us, and I wanted to share this message. Uh, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to, to 1.0 coming out, and uh, yeah, if you have then some questions, feel free to, to ask me. So thank you very much. <clears throat> So there was a guy first. <coughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, the GPI at the end of the day is a GP language. Why did you provide the form to take C++ for production or Rust language? It's a GC language. What do you mean? For high performance, you may want to write something very close to metal, like so you use C++ or Rust language. Yeah, but Julia, once you, you know, compile it AOT, it's a static compilation, then it offers the same speed. And uh, the thing is that you can develop in Julia a lot easier and you know you can connect those two islands which I mentioned before and still you, you can simply avoid using C because it just offers the same speed. So that's why the speed was the, the determining factor. Yeah? Oh, and that, let's, I'm sorry guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, all right.